make sure I record today because I wasn't recording yesterday's eighth grade lesson. So I'm going to project my notes in this document here. They should look like um, what you've either printed off or what you have accessible. So what I want to do is just go through bit by bit and make sense of them. The drawings that I have here are similar to what you hopefully saw in that video yesterday. I'm just going to tease out some parts and point out some other things too. Um, we'll start by looking at Roman numeral one cold fronts. So our capital letter A, I always use blue to indicate anything regarding cold because a lot of times when we think cold, we think the color blue. Um, and then the other part that's really important to indicate right away is this idea here. This is kind of a poor drawing, but this shape that I'm highlighting, this is what we would see on a map to indicate a cold front. And if I go to an actual weather map, Oh, I got it. Hold on a second. Can you see this now? The weather map? So I'll bounce back and forth. So if we look at this picture, I can zoom in maybe a little bit more on the map. All these blue lines with triangles would be our indication of cold fronts. The other important thing to know about this is that the triangles indicate the direction of movement. So if I cursor over this cold front here, this cold front is moving well, in multiple directions, but for the most part, it's moving to the east and a little bit south. And what we would say is that everything behind this blue line with blue triangles has cooler air. And it's all a matter of relativity. So what's cold? Well, we would just say that the air behind here is colder than the air out in front. So it's all about relativity. Just like relative humidity. Relatively speaking, it's colder back here than it is out in front here. So when I go back to my notes, Curious to know if we have any questions on what you see in the drawing or what I've indicated on paper. This is just, if I could split the page kind of in half, or not the page, but the drawing in half. So this part down here, this is like a side view, a cross-section view that was presented to you in the video yesterday where we have cold air that's more dense, sticks closer to the ground, I'm trying to draw this blue line here to show the split between warm air and cold air. Warm air is forced up and over cold air. Any questions on what you're seeing? What would be, I mean, I hope this is as straightforward as I see it, but what kind of weather could we predict for an area with a cold front? No. Who said that? I heard I heard something. Like what what's the weather gonna be like back here? Cold. Yes. I still don't know who said that, but yeah, cold fronts bring cold weather. It was McKinley. Thank you, McKinley. Cold fronts bring cold weather. And we're going to leave it as simple as that. That would be something that you could add to your notes that's really straightforward. I don't have that typed in my document, but you could certainly add it. All right. We're going to whip through to capital letter B because it's not anything drastically different than what we just got talking about. The only difference would be that now we're talking warm fronts. I like to use the color red 
because when we think red, we usually think warm. This time we have a symbol on a map that's a red line with red semicircles. And just like the blue um, triangles did for cold fronts, red semicircles indicate where the warm front is and the direction of movement. So does anybody see where there is a warm front on the picture being displayed? I can tell you that there's only one. A couple of you could please turn your video on so I know you're with me. Can anybody see where there's a warm front on the map? Like, is it on the east coast, kind of near H? Yeah. Yep. So it's this part right here. This yeah. is the only warm front. Well, actually, I'm I'm not 100% sure on that. This could be a warm front up here in Canada. But this one over here that Tim, is that Timmy mentioned? Over by the Carolinas. And somebody besides... Uh, Tim, tell me which direction this warm front is moving, generally speaking. North. Who is that? Uh, Caleb. Thank you, Caleb. Yeah, generally speaking, this warm front is moving to the north. So what we would say is that all of these states behind the warm front have warmer air than the air out here. Question or comment? I don't have a camera on this computer. I don't even know who Taco Dealer is. Using your real names, guys and girls, we're just getting into some of the etiquette of uh, online learning. If you can have your video on, great. If you don't have video capability, I understand that. If you don't have video capability, use your name, please, so I know who you are. As we transition back to the notes, couple of things to make sure that you have. Just like with the cold front, when we have a warm front, it's warmer, more dominant air that just pushes the cold air out of the way. Cold air is still more dense, so it sticks close to the ground. But we just have more of a dominant force in warm air that moves cold air out of the way. And we're just going to add to the idea that warm fronts bring, bring warm weather and I use this word here. Can you see my notes? Yep. Fair, nice weather. Any questions? All right. There's a bunch of other symbols on the map that we're going to um, see now. So the next kind of front that the video, I believe, got into was when warm air and cold air not necessarily meet. We kind of have a trapping of warm air between two chunks of cold air. So when I draw this from a bird's eye view, this is the symbol we would see on a map. Try and highlight that. Um, the side view, though, which I believe the video did a good job of showing, is that we have cold air that's kind of trapping warm air and forcing warm air up and out of the way. So this is the kind of front that usually brings uh, precipitation, cooler air with rain or snow. So again, if I go back to our weather map, we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of occluded fronts on the map, and usually they're associated with precipitation, which all, all these green blobs are. There's one more thing that we'll talk about today, uh, which is what all these H's and L's are, and that has more to do with precipitation than anything else. I guess what I would suggest to you, seventh graders to add to your own notes is that all of this idea with fronts, warm fronts and cold fronts and occluded fronts, 
the biggest thing that those fronts affect would be temperature. The next part of our notes, um, pressure systems or cyclones, those are the, uh, that's the variable that indicates whether or not there will be precipitation. So one more time, fronts affect temperature, pressure, which we'll get into next, that influences precipitation. Any questions before we transition to an, into our last kind of front? See some of you writing, that's good. If you're just following along with printed notes or digital notes, that's good too. All right, last kind of front. So, Stationary fronts are the, I actually haven't drawn a stationary front on the map. I can look up a picture here in just a second. I'll show you what a stationary front looks like. Um, this is where cold air and warm air meet and mix. So stationary fronts are the ones that bring us stormy weather. Does anybody have any questions on any of the fronts that we've indicated? Because we'll drop down into the second portion of the notes and talk about pressure systems. The other, uh, the other thing I want you to keep in mind, seventh graders, with this idea of fronts and pressure systems is that we're talking about gigantic masses of air. When we look at the weather map for today, this cold front here, for example, is an excellent example. It takes up a third of the country being influenced by this cold front. Everything, all of these states, part of Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up to the Dakotas would be influenced by this cold front. Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Wisconsin, all of these would be influenced by this cold front. So giant masses of air. When we talk about pressure systems, same thing holds true. Giant chunks of air where there's either higher pressure or lower pressure. So couple things to note. When we indicate high pressure on a map, it's done so with a blue H. Just know that this time blue doesn't have anything to do with cold. That's a common thing that um, is easy to confuse. Um, high pressure doesn't have anything to do with pre uh, temperature. Pressure and temperature are two unrelated variables. Same thing with this red L. Red L means low pressure. It doesn't have anything to do with hot. That's what we have warm fronts for. Oops. So again, if you can do your best to keep the variables of temperature for the first part of our notes and now pressure for the second part of our notes, here's some ideas that we're going to associate with high pressure. So I've attempted to keep all these bullet points underneath the blue H. High pressure is like if we um, 
high pressure has a drying effect to the atmosphere. It squeezes air dry of all of its moisture. This motion here that we see in kind of an outward clockwise fashion, we call it anti-cyclonic movement. It's a good word. It moves clockwise, but we call it an anti-cyclone, which is the opposite of this other movement we'll see over on the right-hand side. What I want you to know is that high pressure squeezes air dry, so this is usually associated with nice weather. If we go back to the weather map, we're going to see that there's nothing but a bunch of blue H's by us. We're being dominated by high pressure right now. The air's dry, no precipitation, pleasant weather. which is the opposite of what's being experienced in the Midwest. A low pressure system is where air circulates inward. The lack of pressure allows air to lift. So this lifting, cooling, condensing. What forms if air is allowed, especially air with a bunch of vapor in it, what forms if air is allowed to lift and cool and condense? Somebody besides Caleb or Tim. Clouds. Who said that one? Avery. Yeah, we're going to get clouds to form. In really intense low pressure systems, we get big, tall storm clouds. Somebody besides Caleb or Tim, or Avery, what were our big, tall storm clouds called? Our cumulonimbus? Yep, yep. We get those big, tall, cumulus nimbus clouds. Cumulus meaning tall, nimbus meaning precipitation. So depending on the severity or the strength of the low pressure, the lack of pressure, we can get storm clouds to build really, really tall and make pretty powerful storms. Can anybody give me an example? So not McKinley, not Avery, not Caleb, not Tim. Can somebody give me an example of some really powerful storms that would be the result of uh, low pressure? How about... Ray. Uh, like what's an example of a big, huge, powerful storm that occurs? Hurricane Katrina, a hurricane? Yeah. Any hurricane. A hurricane is a gigantic low pressure system. And depending on where they form in the world, we call them different things. So hurricanes come from the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. In the Pacific, they might be called cyclones or typhoons. They go by different names, but it's all related to low pressure. Can anybody think of a smaller example that, especially in the spring of the year, it's nice that we're studying weather in the spring of the year, um, these really powerful storms are also the result of low pressure. Tsunami? Tsunami is a big wave of water that happens in the ocean. That's a good guess. I'm thinking like Texas, Oklahoma, the central part of the United States has got a nickname because of this storm. Big low pressure systems. The Dust Bowl? No. Tornadoes? Yeah, Tornado Alley. And there's already been some so far this season. If we go back to the weather map, there's some pretty severe storms forming out of the Gulf. Those look like they'll carry into the Gulf, so probably not forming any tornadoes. But this central area, south central area of the United States in the springtime especially, gets the right mix of warming air, low pressure, and vapor. And we get a lot of storms, powerful storms, 
called tornadoes, the results of low pressure. So we'll kind of start to wrap things up. The biggest things that I'll want you to be familiar with on the map are the warm fronts, the cold fronts, the occluded fronts, and then the high pressures and low pressures. Is there anything else on this map that you're wondering about or that you see that you say, well, what is that? Dotted black line, I'm not 100% certain on. That's another kind of front. Do you see anything else that looks similar to something that we studied recently? There's a bunch of white lines everywhere. Yeah, what did the white lines look like that we studied recently? Like last chapter. Topographic maps. Yeah, they look like our contour lines. And they're very closely related. These white lines are called isobars. They're not connecting areas of equal elevation but they are connecting areas of equal, what do we think? Somebody other than Caleb. What could these white lines be connecting equal areas of? Like here's one here centered around the L and then another one in concentric circles. Maybe temperature? It's a good guess. They're not connecting areas of equal temperature. So what do we have left? Pressure. Yep. Isobars connect areas of equal pressure. So this is a great example that this white bullseye here with the L dead center is the lowest pressure. And then it gets a little bit higher and a little bit higher and a little bit higher, so on and so forth until we get to areas of higher pressure. So if I move from this L to this H up here in the northern part of Canada, we would slowly be building from low to high or low to high. And it's always just a matter of comparison. We have to have an area that's higher compared to an area that's lower to be able to say what's high, what's low. So with the conclusion of these notes, we wrap up the material that we'll have on Monday's quiz. Monday's going to cover humidity, vapor in the air. Monday's quiz will cover clouds and cloud types. And Monday's quiz might have some reference to warm fronts, cold fronts, high pressure, low pressure. So what we'll do tomorrow and Friday is review. Does anyone have any questions on the notes? There's a couple of you. There's three of you. I'd like to uh, have you stay after I sent you a direct message. Otherwise, if um, I did not ask you to stay after, then you're free to go. Have a good day.